most soldiers never forget their serial number. Mine is 4218 Rank is sergeant. Well, back in the 30s, life was completely different. From what I heard from my mom and that, that they were worried about another war was coming. But for us guys at that age, we were out playing, not worrying about the war. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. That was a day which me and my buddies and all of us in Glen Cove would not forget. It was few of them that were Navy men, Air Force, and some were soldiers, and they were just gone. And a lot of Sadduskis and all, we knew them, we grew up together, and they would never come back. We lost a lot of buddies over there, and they are actually the heroes. The guys who made it through were lucky, and I was one of them. Not me, but most sergeants were the ones that won the war because lieutenants give you an order. He gets an order from the captain. The captain gets an order from CO. CO gets an order from intelligence. And they pass it down to the sergeants, whether you're a sergeant, first sergeant, staff sergeant. And they're the brains of the outfit, and they keep it running as a smooth machine. Well, the question most they ask is, do you ever feel that you're going to die? We had that feeling every day that could be our last day, because whenever somebody's shooting at you, it's a major battle. You could be killed of any kind, even if it's a little skirmish or a big skirmish. But it was like, what do I do if they shoot at me? Do I shoot back? You, you're a kid. You're 18 years old. But well, when you got into combat and you see your buddies fall left and right, you're either going to shoot back or you're going to get killed. So you don't care who's in front of you. It could be a kid of 15, 16, who could kill you just as much as a guy of 25 or 30. You just fire to keep alive. And that's, war is, war is brutal, period. There's no, no remorse that you have to do these things. You were there for your country, you were there for your buddies. Most of us were there to watch each other's backs. And that's how that greatest generation got through that war, by fighting as a team, not fighting each other. But after a while it became a thing where you said a prayer and said, well, if this is my day, God take my soul. And you went into battle. Some guys cried themselves to sleep every night. Either become a man or you're gonna ship out. We boarded the ship and we boarded this landing craft, Bre Breckenbridge. Across the ocean, across the sound, or had the English call it the pond, and we ended up in Normandy Beach was already established. 
went up to the top of the hill, got on trucks, and at that time a big battle was going on for St. Lowe, that's where we joined the Alpha, 29th. And there was in a building standing from when we got up to Normandy all the way to St. Lowe. Everything, only thing you see now and then was a chimney stack, and that's about it. Everything was just demolished. And we got to St. Lowe and it was under heavy fire. We relieved the guys that were there. Now we're rookies. The lieutenant said to me, he said, and the guy's on the line, anything you see move, you were fired. And all along the line, people would fire, 50 caliber, 75, whatever they had. The next day, we moved out of the town to the edge of the town, heading toward the Rhine River, across France. We wanted to get across. As we were moving out, these soldiers popped up and we started firing. And that's the first time that we saw an SS trooper. They were over six feet tall, blonde, blue eyes, and they looked like big robots. When a bullet hit them, they went down. We knew they weren't superhuman. They were just like ordinary soldiers. But that's how you learn to fight because you gotta try to save your life and your buddy's life. So you just fire. You don't care who they are. If they're firing at you, you fire. That fight lasted about, I did a good 20 minutes until they gave up. And we captured 120, 130 SS troops. But it was the first firing experience that we'd seen as rookies. And then from there on, it became just an everyday thing to keep alive. Right there where the big heavy fighting started. Five major battles with St. Lowe, then from there on. Then we went into these towns like Steinberg, Steinhagen, uh, Dusseldorf, Marburg, uh, Gießen. Now the fire fight was so intense at, at the Dusseldorf airfield, because it was a main airfield for the Luftwaffe. And they, they were losing all their planes as it is, but they fought and fought because we didn't know until we took the airfield, there were about 300 jets on the ground with no fuel to fly them. If they did, it would have been a different air, story, air war story because those things were fast and dangerous. So the, the firefight was so bad, I was no more than three feet away from this German soldier and he come at me with a, his bayonet, and I was going at him when all of a sudden, Cloyce Roby shot him right between the eyes. So I didn't have any hand-to-hand -hand combat. And let me tell you, that was the day I was scared. We got down in the valley to the Ruhr. They had to take this farmhouse. Farmhouse was up on a hill. Got halfway up, the fire was too much. The next morning, we fired from the hip, keep them pinned down, and we marched up to the top of the hill. And German soldier, young kid, was hitting the shoulder, another one in the stomach. Got to the top of the hill, and they all surrendered. It was a company, they had a whole company up there. And we met these two people. His name was Maria, and his name was Dominic. And they were Italian prisoners, cooking for the Germans. They saw we were Americans, I spoke to them, and they made us potatoes and egg frittas for the whole company. But the Ruhr Valley, we had to go over to uh, Berlin. And the long way up, they rode us up by truck half the way and we had to fight our way up. Got to the Elbe River, and they said, you guys take this river, but you can't go into Berlin. 
was at the altar meeting between Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. They said that the Russians have the privilege to go in first. So we sat there for two weeks, almost three weeks. Christmas Eve came and all the fighting stopped. Didn't make sense to me until 12.30. 12.30 they start killing each other again. Finally, the, the Russians came. They were coming into Berlin, the Germans. 55,000 of them came across. They surrendered to the 29th. They had hand grenades and guns and everything on them. They just didn't want to be captured by the Russians. 29th Division supplied the men. We captured the entire German V-2 rocket division, and the end was near. And from then on, we were decorated five times by the president. That's five clusters, five little ribbons they give you with gold around it, and five battle stars for the five battles we were in. And the guys who were in Normandy got six. But that's where the 29th came to rest. Yes? It's about time. It's a tribute to all those who really were heroes, the ones that died. Well, you know, you're our hero. We knew that we had to win this war, otherwise Germany was going to take over the world. Take a picture all together, giving you a big hug from me. So we all got to give you a big hug. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then it says, enjoy your day with the boys and celebrate. She wants you to buy around the beers for all your boys. <laughs> Deserves to have a special and great birthday. Love always, man. All right. What you give you then? Put your money away, my wife's paying for this. <laughs> I met my wife, who I love very much. And after 62 years, I guess I'm not going back into service. Uh, the two lovebirds saying goodbye. Ma, if you want, we'll bring them home, Ma. If you want us to bring them home, we'll leave them down in Washington with the old vets home. <laughs> so the greatest generation is dying off at 500 a day. So I don't know when my time is coming. I hope it's not soon. Oh, how are you, everybody? I'm doing good. We're coming back. I'm taking a week's vacation. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. After the first night of fighting, you're not a kid no more. You become a man. And if you don't believe that, you can ask three million GIs, and they'll tell you the same thing. We went in as kids, and we came out as men. <laughs>